Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to Life from the Peloton. I'm Mitch Stocker, and I am joined by a good friend of mine, Sam Bewley. Mate, it's been months, eight months, I think, hasn't it, since we last saw each other? It has been a while. We have spoken a little bit on the phone, but since we've actually seen each other in person, it's been a long time. I'm in Europe, as you can probably understand, or maybe not. Maybe Sam came out to Australia. He is the co-host of the Social Distance Podcast. If you haven't heard that, go across. He's very familiar to talking into the microphone. But we're sitting down here in Bordeaux. Bills, what are we on the eve of? We're on the eve of the Tour de France. We're only a couple of days away now. And it's been bloody good, actually, to catch up with you. Like I said, it's been eight months. And I had this opportunity here. You're on your way to the Tour uh, via Bordeaux um, and Paris doing a little bit of filming and I've joined you for that so you know really enjoying that and looking forward to uh, catching up with you more a little bit over the next couple of days we're going to have plenty of time uh, out on the bike I think exactly because we're doing a documentary which is capturing the old race Bordeaux to Paris we're reliving that we're about to tick off tomorrow we've got 600k in front of us half of us is done on our own pushing the wind and the other half is behind behind the old journeys and of course our podcast this year is brought to you by Rafa and people are, if people have seen online at the moment I was recently in another documentary with GCN down in Tasmania with a good friend of mine and a guest on the podcast Alan Aquani Albie and actually a few people sent me some messages and said hey what were you wearing down there what was what was the apparel you had on well of course it was Rafa but there was more specifically about what I was wearing because we had this funny trip down there we were doing interviews we're on bikes we're off bikes I was like, what are we going to wear? We can't walk around in, you know, normal cycling gear. I was speaking to Rafa. They said, you should try our Explorer gear. You should try our trail gear, which is casual clothes that you can ride in. This stuff, I can tell you firsthand, was amazing because, like I said, these were long days, 12-hour days with about five to six hours of riding in it, but about five to six hours of not riding. So, like, do you want to be sitting in Nick's all day? So go and check this out. This is really cool kit. Actually, cheekily, I wear this stuff around when I'm not riding. I don't know if you're supposed to do that, but that's what I do as well. But now on to the episode. This is a cracking episode that I've got coming up for you. We're on the eve of the Tour de France, like Buell said. And this is the episode which is called The Breakaway Theory. And this is all about understanding what the breakaway is. You might be thinking to yourself, yeah, well, I know what the breakaway is. But actually, do you? Do you, Buells? I know what it is in the sense of the word, but I think there's so much more to learn about the breakaway. There's there's, there's so many games that are played by the, the breakaway artists. Like the, that's exactly what they are. They're artists, the successful ones. You know, the Thomas de Gens, the uh, Taco Vanderhorns, the modern day. He's the modern day artist. Uh, Steve Cummings. All these kinds of guys. All these guys, kind of guys that you know, maybe you're going to get to to hear about hear from on this show and. You know, there's, there's just a, a, a completely different way. Uh, those guys that are successful, they just know how to play the game with the Peloton. And I think that's what's going to be such an interesting episode to learn those sorts of things. And we've got two other guests on there as well. Buell's actually gave you a little sneak peek. We've got the specialist, in my opinion, the the top specialist, the one guy who's mastered the breakaway, Steve Cummings, now the head DS for Ineos. He's going to the Tour de France. You've got to check out his book as well, The Break. I haven't read it, but I can imagine it's going to be awesome because he's awesome when I spoke to him. Taco Vanderhorn, who I think is the modern-day Steve Cummings. The new guy on the scene, Ben Healy. He's running for my team, EF, and he's been in a heap of breakaways. So I chatted to him about what his experience is about being in the early breakaway in the early part of his career. But then on the flip side, Bills, I spoke to El Tractor. Now, who's he? Tim DeClerc. The one and only, the Belgian tractor. Why did I speak to him, do you reckon? I'd say, if I was to take a pick, take a guess, Mitch, I'd say it's because he's the man who doesn't go on breakaways, but he's the man who spends a better part of the year chasing them down. So he's also got to understand the dynamics of the breakaway, the games that have been played. He probably keeps an eye on those guys that you've just mentioned. Are they in the breakaway? Okay, that means I need to ride this, you know, I need to control the, the breakaway a little bit differently because I've got some intelligent bike riders up there. So that'd be great to hear from him and hear the other other side of the coin, the other perspective mm. about chasing the breakaway, uh, which is, you know, equally just as uh, dynamic and interesting. Well, because it's playing the game, isn't it? You know, you've been in breakaways yourself. I've been in there too. And you think you're playing the game, but who's really playing the game? Is it the peloton? Is it the breakaway? And I was interested to hear from both those sides, the breakaway specialist, those three that I spoke about, but also the one and only, the controller, I like to call him. The controller? Yeah. 
Oh, he's he spoken to someone else. No, well, oh, De Klerk. You're talking about El Klerk. Tractor. Yeah, I El think Tractor, he should be called the, contr- the controller. Yeah, El Controller. <laughs> Look, well, Sam, what have you got coming up in your podcast? Because um, Sam releases a podcast as well. Like I said, the social distance he's got. George Bennett on there and the old um, backstage pass, Dan Jones. Tell me what's coming up on your podcast. We've just done a, our own uh, Tour de France preview, which which is out now actually. So yeah, get a, get across there, have a listen. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's if you haven't heard the Social Distance podcast, it's a very different podcast. It's a little bit loose-lipped, I, mm. I guess you'd say. Uh, but get a, get over and have a listen, guys. Um, you'll make your own mind up. But yeah, we've just done a Tour de France preview. We're talking about the contenders, the stages. We, we sort of dive quite deep into the topic of cobble stages in the Tour de France. Should they be in there? Um, I give probably quite a strong opinion on that. Uh, we come up with a couple of silly ideas about how you could do it even better. So, yeah. Well, clearly they should be in there. Shouldn't There should be 21 days of cobbles. Well, we reckon, I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but what about a Roubaix, instead of Paris-Roubaix, Roubaix-Paris for stage 21, Ooh. finish on the Champs, start oh, Roubaix. Oh, wow. So I get like across it. the pod and have a listen to these ingenious ideas that we come up with. <laughs> I love it. Well, I've actually forgotten to mention, because we actually got some really exciting news coming up. If you liked the World Championships collaboration we did with Swa Cycling last year, we have got an amazing collaboration coming up. Yeah, we've gone back together. We thought, that's it. We've got to do something else together. We've got a collaboration coming out in honor of the Tour de France. Our road less traveled, we've called it. The map of the Tour de France. Check it out. This is coming with Swa Cycling. That's Swa Cycling, C-O-I-S, cycling.com. Check that out. That is going to be launched in the next week. Something exciting. We've got some great merch stuff coming out of Life in the Peloton at the moment. So that is on the eve of the Tour de France. And that's going to be selling over the three weeks of the Tour de France. Um, It's going to be snapped up very quick. As always, there's only a limited amount. So that's really exciting. But Bules, just before we get into the episode... What are you looking forward to in this next 600Ks that we're about to take on together? I'm looking forward to experiencing cycling in quite a different way. Mm. Um, and we won't give too much away, but there's going to be there's a few things happening in this 600K that are things that we're not quite used to. But it's going to be a good opportunity to catch up with you after eight months, like I said earlier. And yeah, let's see how fast we can bang the second half out of the race and we've got a bit of man uh, motor power in front of us. So I'm looking forward to seeing that and hoping it's a bloody tailwind as well. Yeah, me too. Well, guys... Thanks, Bills, for coming on. And guys, sit back and enjoy this episode, The Breakaway Theory. Thomas again sees the line. Thomas d'Italia to get bookends a dream decade of breakaway racing. Magnus Court comes round the corner, sprints for the finish line. He looks around. Magnus Court wins the stage. What a climb by Magnus Court. 200 metres, and now he dares to check Taco van der Hoorn. He's got 100 metres, if not more. The road rises up a little bit, and Taco van der Hoorn covers his mouth in disbelief. He's done it. Bravo, Taco van der Hoorn. That is fantastic bike riding, and that is by far, by far the biggest win of his career. Taco van der Hoorn from Rotterdam in the Netherlands is riding with Wanty Gubert in his seventh year as a professional, and he realised after being pro for a few years, his best chance was the breakaway. He's had some iconic victories in the Giro d'Italia, and most recently in the Bellonux Tour. Taco Vanderhorn, welcome to the pod, mate. Um, now, I've picked you out specifically for this podcast because I think you are the new generation of the breakaway specialist. You just, you're just dangerous. You're one of those dangerous guys that gets in the break. You're starting to get into De Gent sort of era that Taco's up the road. Uh-oh, don't let him go. So what I want to talk to you about is who are you, the breakaway specialist? What is a breakaway specialist? And do you consider yourself a breakaway specialist? Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the moment, uh, I feel myself like uh, a breakaway specialist because, yeah, for me, it's the best I, I can uh, in, in cycling. I see myself in a quite nice uh, role with the, the hand and the comics, you say. So, uh, <laughs> it's uh, appreciate that. But, um, yeah, it's going well. And uh, I think uh, I'm happy with uh, it, uh, how it goes and that I can... Just after a few years struggling a bit in the in the world tour, uh, the, uh, maybe this now I find really my my niche where I can can make uh, make a difference and uh, where I can get some results and uh, do some uh, some good bike riding and 
yeah, it can be different, but for me, the burgers always is in the breakaway to win the, the race. So, uh, <laughs> that sounds thing. obvious, but yeah, 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 yeah. But I think there are in the past also a lot of guys just want to show themselves on TV or get in there for a mountain jersey or uh, that kind of things can also be a, a goal, of course. But for me, the goal is always to, to try to win. And I think it's, it's, it's also net that the breakaway is not the purpose of the race. It's just like a, a, a tool to use in the race to win the race in uh, in it. Mm. So, uh, and for me, I can wait until I have to sprint against that, uh, this fast guys or climb up the mountain against the car. But then I never will win something. So uh, I have to do it in another way and like the breakaway uh, to get a to get win. Steve Cummings from England rode for 15 years as a professional is now director sportive with Team Ineos and he favoured the breakaway. He was a breakaway specialist, having won two iconic victories, breakaway victories in the Tour de France. All right, everyone, here we go. Here is the master of the breakaway. I'm talking to him. What is a breakaway specialist in your eyes? What is a breakaway, first of all? I always think about the breakaway like there's two types of breakaway. There's one breakaway, which is for visibility, where maybe teams with lesser budget are there to sort of animate the race and get exposure for their sponsor. And then the other type of breakaway is when you go in the breakaway and you have one thing on your mind, which is you you don't want to waste any energy. You just want to win the race. And that was the breakaways that I was into eventually. (laughs) But of course, you go through the, the whole process of, trying to be in the breakaway for visibility initially, I guess. So if we think about st- stages and bike races as stages that are sort of easy to predict the outcome and are quite easy to control, they're often the stages that you'd be in a breakaway for visibility. Whereas if you think about stages that are unpredictable, the outcome, they're not really GC days. They're not for sprinters. It's, there's a whole big question mark, like who's going to win this stage? How is it going to unfold? Is it going to be a breakaway? Is it going to happen in the final? And that unpredictableness I like. And I think that's why, going back to what I said originally about visibility and, and going into the breakaways to win, there is an element of teams that just are just in the race to, to, to be visible. And then there's teams that are going, going to sort of win. They're unpredictable. Ben Healy is a Neo Pro with EF Education Easy Post, and in his first year as a pro, he has featured a number of times in the breakaway, in the classics, and he is now understanding what it takes to be a breakaway specialist in the World Tour Peloton. Mate, this podcast is all about the breakaway, and you seem to have already, I wouldn't say mastered the breakaway, but you've been in some pretty significant breakaways at the start of your career, and Look, the first year of my career, I was pretty much just trying to keep up, um, and most of the time I wasn't. So to be off the front of the bunch continuously, tell me about what it's been like, first of all, to be in the breakaways and that feeling of like being out there. Yeah, um, I guess like first breakaway of the year was kind of on loop for me. And, you know, there's a DS told me to start the day, you know, just try your hands and see, see how far you can make it and get in that breakaway and you get seven minutes and then... I was like one of the last guys to, to stay out there. So that was a pretty cool feeling, you know, and especially to do it on loop, you know, everyone's pretty, got pretty good form preparing for the classics and to kind of just realise that, yeah, maybe I do have the legs to be competing with these guys like sooner or later, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's a nice feeling. And then to carry that on for a year and getting a couple more, yeah, decent breakaways and, and yes, yeah, show again that I have the legs is, is yeah, it's a good feeling. I'm speaking with Tim De Klerk. He has earned the nickname El Tractor due to his frequent work on riding the front of the bunch, just plowing along. Um, in the 2020 poll by the riders, I didn't even know this, doing a bit of research, De Klerk was named the best domestique in the world. Right, let's just talk about it. Why do you think we have breakaways in races? Why do we have them? Why don't we just ride as one big group to the finish and have a bunch sprint? Why do we even have breakaways? I, I think it was it used to be a little bit like this in the past when you speak to some uh, riders back in back in the 80s that they just went went easy. Uh, sometimes they only got half of the price money if the average was below 30. I uh, <laughs> I hear 
So uh, and then they start racing when uh, when uh, the camera uh, got on with 50 or 60k to go. Uh, maybe it was also also nice to see because for sure that then there was a, a lot of action. Uh, but now uh, guys try to get up the road for for two reasons. I think first uh, for the publicity, but also if you manage a breakaway well, I think more and more now if you see it uh, in the last uh, Giro and, and also in, in Dauphiné a lot of times the breakaway has a if, if they work together they have a also uh, not the, the biggest chance but they have a stand, chance to, to stay in front and if you're not a, a real climber it's uh, often your uh, your best chance to, to get a, a, a win or a, or a good result. What about getting into a break now? Um, because you guys, and I often see this in a Grand Tour, you probably notice this too, it's literally about probably 10 guys who alternate who are the same guys you get in the breaks every single day. You know, it's the same sort of guys and maybe one or two guys get in and out. What is the knack of getting in the break? It's sort of like a black magic you guys have. You guys just have this smell for it. You know how to get in the break because it's not as easy as you think. Yeah, I think uh, first of all, Good, good preparation, like knowing um, the route a little bit, picking out those stages that are unpredictable, that aren't GC days and aren't sprint days. And then I was always reliant a little bit on how the race sort of evolved in the, on the road. Um, if it was, if the harder it got at the start, the better it was for me because the, the less control, the less control it had. So often I was like, yeah, hopefully it's going to go off today. And, uh, but you can, you can predict those, you know, it's, it's technical roads, like, I don't know, third cat climbs, second cat climbs, lefts and rights through narrow towns, stuff like that, where the race is just moving, moving. And, uh, it's a fight to, to be in the front and, um, to get, in the breakaway, sometimes I've done it like tried once or gone in a moment. It's all where it's almost like a selection rather than um, a lottery. So it becomes like a selection, as I say, through positioning and moving well and, and, and following the right wheels and stuff like that. And then other times I've tried several times without, <laughs> uh, without. So there, there is, I, I do think there's a bit of an art to it, but at the same time, you've got to really try because at the, 2015, I spent a lot of pennies getting into that breakaway in the tour. But I think that was just, it's spending them in the right place, if you know what I mean. If you spend them yeah. when everyone else has to spend, I always thought that's okay. If you're spending them when nobody else is spending them, that's not super smart because eventually you <laughs> run out of bullets. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it's just trying to be calm and then just trying to see which teams want to, want to do what in the race. And you get a feeling maybe there's 10 teams that want to control the race and then it's like, well, you can't really go against the majority. You have to have the feeling and be patient because, and sometimes it can happen when you don't expect it to. So just being ready. Because you were quite, I mean, this is my opinion, maybe it's not correct, but <laughs> I either saw you at the back or at the front. Um, there was no middle time for you. You know, at the back, it was like, cool, I know what I'm doing today. But when you're at the front, it was obvious that for me anyway, that, okay, Steve-O's going up the road today and it's a breakaway day. That didn't change anything for me because often then I just wouldn't be able to get in the break because it was too hard. What is it like then when everyone knows that you're going for the break and then you become a marked man? Because like I said, you became a bit of a known name once you won those two tour stages from breaks. You know, they weren't just... Uh, lucky breaks not that there ever is they knew when you went up the road it was serious so how do you get in the break then how do you navigate around that when you've become known as a specialist well physically I tried to improve <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the thing because you, you kind of have to because as you say you are marked and people will say oh don't let him in the break or I want to go in the break with him so there was an element of that but I actually kind of sort of reversed it and, and used it in my favor and just tried to put the power down really when it was really hard in the race, when it was really getting stretched or try to influence at the start, maybe like going 85, 90% and, and just trying to encourage the race to move a little bit and then sort of saving your bullets for a little bit. You know, you, you have to play around a bit. It's quite, quite nice. I enjoyed it. Who's allowed to go in the breakaway? And when I say allowed, because it seems like, you know, there's different ways for the breakaway. There's GC guys that can't go in the breakaway or there's certain, you know, teams that have a sprint coming that day that they don't want them to go on a breakaway. In your mind, 
who's allowed to go in the breakaway in a certain race? Yeah, it is really depending on the race and the teams that are starting. Um, so when I was in Jumbo, for example, it was much harder to be in the breakaway. And, uh, exactly. Uh, Why? Yeah. Yeah, because of the jersey. Yeah, the jersey. Yeah, yeah. The, the big teams don't want another big team to have in the breakaway because otherwise there's a lot, big chance they will control the race or sample. Uh, so the, the big team is always right behind each other, and uh, so that's that's a bit of the, the thing. And, and I think you also see it really in the classics yeah, when uh, there were a few teams that all, always right behind each other, but Jumbo, Ineos, uh, Alpecin with uh, Mathieu. Uh, quick step, and a quick step. Yeah, the four that four teams were always attacking behind each other, and the rest were allowed quite allowed to go. So, um, did you yeah. notice a big difference, like you said, with Yumbo? That yeah, because look, I noticed a big difference when I was in Skill Shimano. I could that was my job also to go on the breakaway, and I thought I was quite good at getting in the breakaway. But actually, I think it had a lot to do that I had a. A, sh- a shit jersey on. No one really cared if I went in the breakaway. I thought, oh, I'm so good at getting in the break. Yeah, as soon as yeah, I went yeah. to Green Edge, I couldn't get in the breakaway anymore. I'm like, I've lost my skill. But actually, yeah, yeah. it didn't have a lot to do with that, did it? No, that's a good uh, good example for it. Yeah, it was, especially when I was in Rompot before Jumbo, it was also quite easy. And then Jumbo, it became much harder. And now it was more easy in Intermarché, but now it's getting more difficult again because, yeah, I got a bit of, bit of a name. So uh, it's, get, it's getting a bit difficult, more difficult again for it to go in the really small uh, breakaways. But uh, it's uh, uh, yeah, it's, but it's it, you can really feel the difference between the teams where you're riding for. Explain to everyone what it means to be not allowed in the break because I've got that in here. Some guys aren't allowed in the break. What does that actually mean? So going back to what we were saying before about at the start of the race, if, the, if it's easy to control the race, if you've got sort of five sprint teams or six t- sprint teams, it's easy, quite easy for them to sort of block the road. There's nothing obvious where you can put the teams in the red. There's no climb. You can put them in the red. All you can do really is attack in the flat. And if you've got, I don't know, a quarter of the peloton in your wheel, you know, it's it's just not not possible to, to, do, to mm. do anything. So uh, you're just wasting your energy and annoying the sprint team side. <laughs> was really Did you have like in your mind your signature move? Like my signature move in my mind was the break goes. It's a gap that's just too far for people to jump, but they're just there. And I had like a one minute sprint in me that was too hard for anyone just to sit in your wheel. But if I couldn't make it before I sat down, <laughs> then it was all over for me. So I, I was like a 900 watt, one minute, all in. That was my signature, just as the gap was there, and I'd be the last guy to make it. What was your, sig- your signature? Yeah, I mean, I could do that. I was, you know, I was quite aerodynamic on the bike. I'd say more aerodynamic than most. So I knew I could sort of – I had that in my locker where you can kind of wait, and that does give you confidence. And I remember when I had good sensations on the bike and you're in good form, it's almost like the race slows down and you, you, you can decide. You don't need to panic and you can see everything unfold. So that that's really a question of being super fit. But yeah, I could always, when I was really fit, I always felt like I had time to make decisions. Whereas I think mm. sometimes that's when you make mistakes, when you don't have time to make decisions. But the fitness and the position on the bike and all of those things, that gives you the time. So you would like to let it form and ride across. See, that also scared me when it was about 30 seconds to a minute. And that group was gone. Let's say a minute. Were you nervous about trying to jump across that gap, or you didn't mind? You're like, cool, I'll take that on. You know, because you don't want to do the walk of shame, not make it and come back. <laughs> yeah. No. I think- <laughs> Have you done the walk of shame? That laugh in- signified to me you've done the walk of shame. Probably when I was younger. I don't. I don't want to admit it, but probably did the walk of shame when I was younger. And you live and you learn. No, as I think as I got. Older, I was a bit more like, fuck it, I don't care about the walk of shame, to be honest, because as a rider who's trying to win from breakaways, you don't get so many opportunities. So it's better to go all in and, okay, worst case scenario, you're going to have to do the walk of shame. But I think as you get older, your judgment becomes better. And luckily, I didn't have to do the walk of shame too much when I was older. (laughs) You can always hide in a bush as well and pretend you're having a uh, go to the toilet. (laughs) This is Taco. If you uh, then uh, I think a lot of times if you are in the gap and the the, the group is already maybe uh, forty seconds away or something, 
and you try it on the flat road and there's not an extremely strong breakaway, just a, a group of five, six, then you will always make it uh, uh, to the to the first group. Because if you attack uh, and the peloton lets you go, that's normally the hard thing to get that the peloton lets you go. But if you're in between, then normally the break will wait uh, for you to have you uh, have you on the on the group. So, but the hard thing is to get away from the peloton because if you jump, everybody will react. So, uh, yeah. but if you're if you're in between, then most of the time you will uh, you will make it. Yeah. But what about the times you don't and you have to come back on your own? Has that happened to you before? No, I never, never, never had it. <laughs> All right, no. that's why you're a breakaway specialist. That only happens yeah. to guys like me. <laughs> All right. What's your knack to getting in the break and why are you so successful at getting in the break? Okay, because it's not just about your jersey. Like you said, when you were in Yumbo, it was harder, but you could still get in the break. And now you're in Intermarche. People know you already. You've got this name. You're a specialist now, but you still get in the break and you're still really dangerous. So what is it? How do you get in the break? Yeah, it's just a lot of times it's just a lot of trying. And it's, uh, uh, it's, 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 you never know really when the break's going. So you can, uh, I remember that a few years ago that was taking for the, all the classics were taking so long time to get in breakaway. It was 80k of jumping before you were in. And then everybody was thinking, ah, oh, Tour of Flanders, I was going to take so long. And then the first attack, boom, every, the breakaway was gone. So you you never know exactly. So the, you always have to be, be sharp of what's happening. But uh, yeah, there are some tricks where you can look for. So you, you can really look. Okay, look to the parkour and when is the road wide, when is the road narrow? Because there are a lot of bigger teams that at one time they will try to let a break go, but not a really, really big or good uh, group. So uh, they want to try to block the road. So uh, uh, if so, that there are maybe five guys and the two guys of top sport and some other guys uh, try to get away. But not the real dangerous group with yeah. uh, big teams of fifteen guys. So, and then they try to control that, and it's easy to control that on a on a on a narrow road because you can just block the road. Uh, so you always try to keep okay. If there is a narrow road coming up, then it's more important to to try to to fight for your for the breakaway because then they can close the, bro, uh, the road and you can stay away. And on the big road, there's always someone from behind to who also want to go in and keep on attacking. So that is much more hard. So that's the parkour. You can really look into it, uh, uh, how it, and, and for me it's, and then you, some guys are just also when there is more climbing or for example, some guys are just waiting. Okay. You probably know that on that climb, the breakaway will go. But for me, it's never an option because I, if, if they go on the climb, I'm never there. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so I always have to, to have it from the flat, uh, flat part. But you can see, especially that's with the parkour and then in the race, yeah, you can just look, okay, well, what are the teams? Uh, who is attacking? Uh, is it, is it, is it really a good one on to follow this? Or for example, if, if one of, I, I try always to, if one of the big teams go for Jumbo of Ineos or Quickstep, then I don't, don't go. And everybody mm. is always reacting actually on that big teams. But if, because everybody is reacting, the break doesn't go. So it's better to react right. on small teams. Did you have any other sort of strategic things like, you know, losing time? Clearly, once, you've, you, once you're on GC, you can't go on the break. So was that a, a plan of yours to lose, strategically lose time or you just naturally did anyway? <laughs> <laughs> this is Steve Cummings. A bit of both, Mitch. So it depends, it depends, on, it depends on the race. Um, I was always eventually, you know, I did. I think I did seventh once in Tirana, which was pretty good. We finished up Terminilo, and um, I'd start these races, these week long stage races, and I'd often have in my head, let's you know, let's keep the GC option open, but let's not um, like if I lose time, it's not a big problem. And then sometimes it was like, I can't do GC. It's better I sit up, lose time straight away, and then I'll have more freedom in the breakaway. So just, it really depended on the race. I was very clear on what I could do and what I couldn't do. Yeah, and how, where you could best help the team. I think there's, there's uh, in cycling, there's always this thing of being from, being from, being from, but eventually there's not enough space for everyone <laughs> to be in front, as you know. <laughs> As you know, so you got to, I don't know, I think it's it's wise to have a different strategy other than just being in front. Um, 
of course, like if you've got a sprinter or a GC guy, it makes complete sense for, for everyone to invest in that. But if you don't have that, then um, it's sometimes it's nice to do something different. For you, um, what makes a real successful break? So you make a break and you look around and you think, okay, this is going to be a good one. This is what I hope for. What's the most ideal break for you? Yeah, yeah. First, the parkour is, of course, really important. So uh, that's also always where I look to in front of uh, the the stage to, okay, how is the parkour and is it narrow? Is it wide? Uh, how does it work? Uh, and that kind of stuff. So uh, always look if, if it's really a wide uh, final and easy to control, then it's maybe not the best to go in the breakaway. But if you have more hectic and more narrow oh, roads yeah. and that kind of stuff, then the peloton is just, for example, last year in, in, in Bing Bang, I was really sure that if we have a good rake, we will make it out. It doesn't matter mm. what the peloton is actually doing. We will make it because the, the mm. roads were just so narrow or, uh, that's, uh, for some parts that the peloton is more busy to position for the narrow roads than catching the brake back. And if they are on the narrow roads, they're fucked because they have to uh, ride so hard to position there. Uh, so there's never going to be a really good control. And if you then have a, a break with strong guys who do, F, uh, do pace even in turns. the right way. Yeah. Mm. And even turns, then you will make it. And you can, the peloton can as ride as hard as they can. But if you have the good guys and the good parkour, it's almost impossible to get you back. And yeah, an example for that is maybe the, the last year, the Bing Bang Tour. Then I was in the break with uh, Luke Durbridge. Yeah, that was, that's a nice guy to have, uh, have in the breakaway because he's big, he's strong. <laughs> and some other guys, so it's uh, a Norse guard, also a big Danish guy from Movistar. And Batistella was in. And one guy of Top Sport was not really, really good. But the other guys were really, <laughs> really motivated and uh, really sure, okay, how are we going to do this? And then it's just about saving energy in the first part. So I always, I, a lot of times I make a bit of the guidelines. Okay, guys, uh, everybody do one minute turns. Uh, because, ah, so you talk uh, to the group. You all yeah. the, When you get out there, are you often the, let's say it, the, the boss of the group why you just set the rules hey guys let's you know let's try and do this let's try and do that are you always that guy yeah actually yeah yeah i mean and, ah. and now from especially from the last time i get a bit of a name so it's it's more easy to get everyone behind you <laughs> so uh yeah. but uh yeah so i always what do you do, say yeah yeah i always say uh for i uh, look a bit at the core and what's happening but normally it's if you have uh, and how big the group is, but normally it's like okay, everybody one minute turns, easy riding because a lot of problem. Uh, what what happening a lot of times is that uh, people start to try double, so they just uh, rotate the whole time, and it's really mm. not efficient. So uh, because there's always two riders in the front, so two times uh, two guys who are uh, in the wind. In the wind, you yeah, have always. Uh, every time one rider is swinging off, you lose two meters because of the bike length. So it's in the end, if you also, uh, uh, pretty funny, we did some, uh, also some things about it to just turning and you see how the watts were, or you do longer turns and see how the watts were. And it's, it's so much more efficient to do longer turns. And if you say then, okay, everybody one minute, then everybody is also committed to do one minute and there's no, one guy who do a bit shorter because if it, one guy does a bit shorter, you have a bit of the group pressure that you will do longer uh, and also do mm. one minute. And if you don't set a strict boundary, then everybody, the one guy is doing two minutes and the other guy is doing 30 seconds. And then the guys who are doing two, ter- two, minutes ter- two minutes turns and think, yeah, but he's saving. So I also save. And then you get a bit mm. of a problem in the, in the break. So it's the best to have just, all the same, uh, then mm. you get the good, uh, good, and then it's just actually uh, easy because then it's just for a, a few hours. It's just doing <laughs> that and not really riding hard and just eat and drink and do that, uh, do that thing, and it's, it's not really special. And then at one time you think, okay, now, uh, and the peloton is just riding behind you and give you maybe four minutes, maybe three minutes, and it doesn't really matter actually. The peloton decides how much they will give you, and you also don't have to work for it. You don't have, but a lot of guys, you go, ah, oh, we have to go faster because we have to get more time. 
but then the peloton starts to ride also harder oh, really? and you get to say yeah. it's, it's the same time so uh it's that's that's the the for the first part of the breakaway that's actually the thing you do it's not that yeah it's just uh doing your job and not to think too much about something um for me it was all about the start if, if it was a really hard start guys who'd be in the break with strong guys who meant business if it, if it wasn't a hard start you'd get some guys who weren't strong didn't mean business and um yeah want to miss turns and stuff like that and i that used to infuriate me because yeah if you're gonna if you're gonna go you go to try and win and and, and commit and not mess around there's no point going half-hearted um, but at sometimes as well, yeah, it's better to do like longer turns, but I didn't really talk too much about it. I just, um, by example, more than anything, like maybe sometimes mm. you say short turns or long turns, but you didn't come out and set a standard. You just went, if everyone was rolling turn for turn, would you just continue with it? My kind of golden rule was I tried to do as little as the guy who was doing the least, if that made sense. I wasn't the okay. guy who wanted uh, to show how strong I was. The opposite, really. Um, it's important, but sometimes I've said that you, you know, it's it's how you spread your energy. Sometimes, if you're really strong and there are people messing around in the break, then I'd use like a climb and really try to like, <laughs> sort of <laughs> get rid of get rid of the dead wood. Yeah, exactly. Get get rid of them, or you know, you it's almost like you go back to square one again. You try and do a selection, and get rid of who's dead, find out who's strong and who's not strong. Do it like that, really. I, I remember once, like, Chavanelli kept following me around the tour once, and um, eventually I just let, because I had Eddie in front with me, and Michael Massey's on the stage, or maybe Sagan, I can't remember. But eventually I let the wheel go. I kind of re- regret it and took took Chavanel and a group of others out the back, and it's like a slight crosswind. I kind of regret it because I didn't get to play the final, but he was just literally stuck to my wheel, you know, and in the final it was only like a short third category climb, so it would have been difficult to drop anyone. So I kind of felt it was a stage for that suited Eddie better than me with, with Saga and Michael Matthews and stuff like that. But I do regret not uh, not doing that really. But <laughs> sometimes it's, it's bike racing, isn't it? You uh, make your choice, and that's it. I was going to ask you: Have you ever backed someone out, you know, in in that kind of form, and then you know hit them or anything? But you've actually done the full back out, Chavanel. That's like proper Tour de France. That's the ultimate back out you could you could ever do. I think I was annoyed with the team as well, you know, like it was, it was a team that was like ours, direct energy. And, and obviously it was, the DS was talking to them in the car and telling them not to pull and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, it's, it's Chavanel. It's not like he won more yeah. bike than I. Why should he not pull, you know? Um, and in the end, yeah, it really, did, really didn't like it. It really annoyed me. And um, it's kind of, for me, it's like an unwritten rule unless you've got a really good reason not to pull. And he didn't have a good reason. Um then you, you should do your share hmm. like everyone else. This is Ben Healy. You don't really want anyone close on GC or a favourite of a race. Uh, I guess, yeah, like seven, eight riders. Because, you know, when they, when seven, eight riders get rolling together, it's, it's pretty hard to bring that back. And maybe like sometimes if it's seven, eight, then, you got, then obviously the peloton's a bit more more wary. But if you still, if you've got seven, eight riders rolling through, I think you, you go as fast as a peloton almost if you're, if you're fully committed. And as long as you, like, if seven, eight strong guys is, is pretty hard to bring back. And mm. then, yeah, for sure, it's, it's, a, it's a good number for me. What are you learning then when you're out there in the breakaway, like from different guys? Is Are people coming out there and talking and saying things like, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. You know, are you listening and going, oh, okay, that's how it works. What have you learnt since being in the breakaway so far this year that you didn't expect happened? Yeah, I, I think a little bit is it's kind of that thing of going slow so the peloton's not chasing and you guys are fresh and then, yeah, just hitting it real hard at the end. Like, I think that really works well if you're a, a smaller breakaway as well because at the end of the day, you, you're not going to be able to put the, the peloton under pressure if you're riding hard all day. So yeah, I think I think that's kind of what I've learned, and that was when I was in the in the group at, at, at Kerner with uh, Taku, and obviously he got pretty close to the finish there, and you know with yeah it, it, only a few seconds wasn't it in the end, so he, he mm. almost made it. So that's it's, it's for sure a tactic that I've learned that is proven that it can work. Is it different to when you were in breakaways in the in the under twenty three and in the amateurs? You're like, oh, this this would never have worked in the amateurs. 
Yeah, I think so, for sure, because, like, for one, you don't have the radios. I think the radios, like, kind of, you know, everyone knows where everyone is, so you, you, you can kind of judge your effort a lot better, but in the amateurs, you know, it's just, it's riding hard the whole time, you know, because <laughs> you know, there's, there's never a team sat on the front, like, really controlling it either. It's just, like, the peloton's still racing behind most of the time, so... Yeah, you kind of just it's, it just felt like full gas. Was that was that strange then? When because I spoke to Taco and he come he told me that he comes into the group and he sort of tries to tell a little bit how it is. You know, we're not going to roll off through and off. We're going to roll one minute only. Blah blah blah. Was that a bit strange for you to think? Hang on, this is not how the breakaways work, is it? Was it a bit of a an awakening <laughs> for you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I kind of like. You know, heard that that's how it how it goes, I guess. But I'd, obviously, I've never experienced that from myself. So yeah, to to, have, to now experience that, it's, there's definitely a lot more thought than you know just going off the front and burying yourself. Mm. I guess there's a, a lot more to it than than meets the eye. Why do you like being in the break? Um, is it something you like to do? Do you like to be out in a small group riding in the wind, opposed to being in the peloton? Because for me. You know, you go on the break day after day. For me, going in a breakaway, a grand tour is hard enough as it is. If you go into a breakaway and essentially end yourself by the end of the race, whether you win or lose, you, you're pretty buggered at the end. How do you go day after day and get through these races? And also what motivates you to go in breakaways aside from the win? Is it just going for the race win or you actually just prefer to be out there in the breakaway? It's something you like. Taco Vanderhorn. I like it to be in the breakaway, yes, because it's a bit, yeah, you have something to do and, but it's, uh, but it's always with a purpose. So it's not the goal to be in the breakaway. It's always a tool with it, just said to, to get the results. And for me, and I can just stay in the buns, but then I will never do, uh, do, uh, Gesundheit. So, uh, <laughs> but, <Bedankt>. uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, nice. <laughs> uh, so it will never be, uh, 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 then I never will be the, win the race, so I have to I have to use the breakaway to get the results. So it's really about that. And if I think okay, this can be a good day for the breakaway, then I just go for it and try it. And then still eighty percent of the time or ninety percent of the time you didn't make don't make it. And uh, but yeah, if you just try enough, then there will always be one time when you when you will succeed. So. Um, yeah, that's always the motivation I have to uh, to go for the break. Tell me about playing the game with the peloton. Um, so you know, when you get up the road, tell me how that works and who is controlling who. Yeah, it depends again on the situation. Really hard starts where it's where the race has gone out of control. That's it. The race is finished. You know, the, the winner's going to come from the breakaway. But when it's not, hasn't been so hard, and maybe you get six guys and it's in the balance or four guys, playing the game would be you have to ride hard, but not so hard that you sort of save some energy for the final and then really accelerate in the final. I think they did it really well in the Giro with um, Magnus Court. There was four mm. of them. It's gone. Uh, I can't remember who won the stage. Um, the thing, um, De Bont won. That's it, yeah. And so I thought they did it really well, but I don't know. You don't see it. I always think, like, for me, watching it, it's like a DS era. <laughs> I'm sorry for all of this, but I just kind of think, don't gamble, don't play around. You know you know the guys who are in the breakaway, so it's better have them back early and guarantee your bunch sprint rather than play around, especially with four strong guys like that. But having said that, Maybe they they were just strong anyway, and they, they wouldn't have got caught. But definitely, they sort of pick a point. I remember being when I was a young rider, being in the breakaway with who's now I work with as a DS, Sebastian Carnavan, and he was like orchestrating the breakaway. Now we go easy. Now we go fast. And there's definitely an art to putting the power down in certain sections, technical sections, where you know the the DSs tell the, the riders keep keep the gap at two minutes. The guys who are pulling behind, and then all of a sudden it goes up to three, and you're like, what? because they just went fast in in the right place and then there's a bit of panic and so that's really cool as well when you see that and that that, that Giro stage was the latest example I, I saw where they did it really well what's it like being caught on the line like you you've you've committed so much you've gone for that break that feeling that let down feeling like you've just gone for it and you caught we've seen these images it's happened to you you get caught in the last moments what's that feeling like yeah, it's really shit, of course. So uh, it's really <laughs> shit. But you know, 
it, you know, it's, it can happen. Uh, and um, sometimes you just stay away with a few seconds and sometimes it just caught you on the line. This year was a pretty big goal to, to do Kuna in a good, uh, good, uh, good performance there. And then I was in the break and I survived and I was caught by some guys and I attacked again with Laporte and uh, Narvaez. And we got caught with uh, maybe, I uh, think, um, yeah, 50 meters to go. And um, <laughs> yeah, that was really shit because otherwise, I, for sure, I was second and maybe I could go over Laporte and maybe you win Kuhn and then in the end you are dead. You have nothing. So, um, but it was, yeah, that's really shit feeling because you're all day trying to go there. And then I was also quite, when I'm looking back with 1K to go, I think, oh, I'm sure we're going to make it. And then still don't make it. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, that was a bit of a bummer. Yeah, I think that's just, it's, it's never a nice feeling, you know, it's yeah, horrible. <laughs> it's the only way to put it. It's like you, you, you've done all that work, you've been out front all day, and then I decide to catch you right at the end. It's like, come on, you could have just <laughs> give it, caught me a bit early and give me some rest. Yeah, I, I remember Dauphiné in 2015 when we went before the tour there. I was alone, a few K to go, Froomey came past me, there was a few of them came past me, Froomey and uh, I think Simon Yates. And Froomey needed the time bonus to win the stage. And otherwise, it would have been the stage win. And then I remember another stage in the tour in 17 when um, RDS had spoke to the Sky DS and they'd said, oh, no, they weren't going to chase. So it was like the break was good. It was like we were nailed on to go to the finish. And then for some reason, they burnt them all. They burnt them all in the valley, which they paid for later. And, yeah, I got caught on the pair of swords. And that would have been, if I'd have won then, that would have been the most spectacular by far. But um, What's it like? I just used to, as I say, you think my used to be very like, okay, the results, sometimes you can't really control, but you can control the performance. So I was always thinking, okay, was the performance good? If the performance is good. It's fine. It is what it is. And try, got to try again mm-hmm. and keep trying as a, that's how the, how the breakaway is. Because in my opinion, you don't have much control. If, if five, six teams decide they want to sprint or they want to do the GC battle on the final climb, that's the reason you're trying in the breakaway in the first place because you're not strong enough to be with them. So um, I used to think more about the performance and just say, okay, take the positives and, and, and move on to the next stage. Never was like, yeah. nah, I never really had that. I, I, I guess that was a positive thing. That I was never, yeah, just like, whatever, it is what it is. Try my best. Let's try again tomorrow or next day or next race, whatever. Tim de Klerk, tell me about that orchestrating the breakaway because it's, it's, I've talked to the other guys about the art of getting in the breakaway. It's a real yeah. black magic. They know how to do it. But I think on the other side, there's a bit of an art about orchestrating a good breakaway and understanding how do you do that? Is it about blocking the road? Is it about intimidation? What's your tactic to make sure you have a good breakaway? My idea is always, of course, yeah, I, I, we, yeah it's, our job. It's, it's important for our team that, that we can get the, the breakaway back and, and Hopefully, with uh, the least amount of, of energy spent as possible. But I will, I will never really intimidate uh, somebody. For me, it's it's always everybody is allowed to go in the breakaway. Um, of course, something like yeah, blocking the road is, is part of that. It's already mm-hmm. 40, 50 years that that this has been done. Now it's just on uh, on television, so they can they can always see it. Uh, th- this is something, yeah, with, with all the teams who want a smaller breakaway, who, who does this, but I'm never gonna write somebody in the, in the ditch if they still want to attack or, um, I just try to stay in the way or, or react immediately if, if some of the stronger guys goes. And of course you need always help for your teammates. This is something you cannot mm. do alone because sometimes you go and then, uh, you get, uh, get caught back and there is a new wave. Mm. riders come and suddenly your position 50 or 60 where you cannot do anything anymore <laughs> we also get uh, get blocked some sty- sometimes so then it's even you to have- <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah then then it's important that uh, that you have some teammate who can who can react when you're uh, when you're blocked or when you just spent uh, a big amount of energy to to catch some uh, some guys back that you that you don't uh, don't really like to be in a, to be in the break like for example, the the second to last stage in the tour, stage nineteen, is already for two three years that it's a, a flatter stage. But yeah, then 
Damn. so many guys want to go this is uncontrollable so yeah sometimes you also have to have to let it go tell me about that when it does go and it's too big it's not what you want what are you are you nervous when you see 15 18 guys strong guys in the tour go up the road what's your feeling when a big group goes yeah, then i i try to to speak in the radio when i cannot react i i ask uh i for some other guys to to jump with them uh because then it's always better that we still have a uh, have somebody in we see a little bit i remember uh, tour of flames 2018 uh when we knew me and uh Ilio case had to mm. probably we're gonna have to control the whole race alone and uh, then we changed tactically tactics a little bit. We said, yeah, if, if you're gonna have to ride on the front, it's gonna be so much energy we have to spend that we will have no uh, no help. So we tried to get the race going, and as long as there was the speed oh. in the bunch, when we were always going 50k an hour, and we, just, and we follow, we follow, we follow. We never tried to to block draw. So in, in the end, the breakaway went only after 90 or 100k, and then it was 100k. We didn't have to really right because then the, le- the rest of the race until second time quarter months we rode with two and we controlled with two but so yeah you have to to see a little bit uh, the situation mm. because when it always goes back to 30k you know when they stop and attack again then it's much harder for us to, to react every time so yeah depends a little mm. bit uh, the situation and you need a uh, a little bit of uh, of expertise to to try to decide what you what you're gonna do. Yeah, so it's the reverse tactic. You keep the race going, opposed to shutting it down. Everyone thinks it's all about blocking the road, but actually, you can use it the other way around. You can keep the race going as long as you've got it in control. The race is going to get further, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's exactly what uh, it, it's it's a bit different in uh, in classics than uh, than in stages, of course. But that's indeed what what we want. If, mm. if we have a, a big favorite on the road, we we just want the race to be controllable. Uh, and how it in the end, how it turns out for us, it doesn't really matter as long as we have the feeling we can uh, we can control and, and close the gap when uh, when we have to to get uh, our guys for the final and in the in the best possible position that they can uh, for sure have a chance to to win the race. Do you get nervous when you see guys like Taco Vanderhorn or Steve Cummings get in the breakaway and you hear the call on the radio, Taco Vanderhorn, Steve Cummings, yeah, in the breakaway, are you thinking, ah, oh, I've got a big day in front? Yeah, but I, I <laughs> when I do the race, it mostly I, I, uh, I try to follow these, of course, to follow these these guys. Uh, of course, <laughs> you cannot you cannot follow them all, but like for example, if I know uh, uh, for sure in the part that the, the hand want to go, I, I I stay near the hand. I, I yeah. okay, it's 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 silly for him. I know it's it's uh, yeah, but it's also a little bit uh, the problem when you have when you. When you want so, so many races, and yeah. when, when everybody knows you're such a strong rider, same with uh, with Taco. Also, if if uh, Remy Cavagna was not in my team, yeah. that's also somebody that yeah. I would uh, try never to let go. So sometimes I don't understand if other teams have to control. Like for example, when I was watching Brussels Cycling, that they let go such a, such a big big uh, big and strong group on the road. Of course, you uh, you can never know the the situation. It was also rainy, I think. There, I was not there, but. Yeah, if it's raining and it's racing full gas, uh, and also when they go up a climb, for you, you will know that it's for sure uh, a stronger breakaway. So that you also have to have to keep in mind. And then I I try to react immediately because yeah, mm. you know, in, in the cars it's all always uh, for, uh, for sure. You still know, uh, you know it from uh, from in the day when uh, it's always the poker game they want to play. Mm. And uh, yeah, we don't ride, we don't ride, so we go. To, and it goes really fast because if you, then you go with the peloton 25, 30k an hour in the front, they go 50. So uh, I <laughs> shoot at the time it, it goes up really, really fast. When I know I have to, I, I mostly I'm gonna, I'm gonna start because uh, we 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 did it sometimes also to play the poker game and goes up to seven minutes and in the end then then you have to glo- close the, the seven minutes. Partly by your own, so yeah, <laughs> it's. Uh, I have to say that I try not to give them too much time anymore. It's just because I, I underestimate nobody. I, I know the, the level of the bunch is is so high. Tell me about playing the game because you know these guys. I've spoken to Steve Cummings. I've spoken to Taco, and they think they play the game with the peloton. But actually, who's yeah. playing the game in terms of? 
understanding when you're chasing, when they're not chasing, the bunch is pulling them back. And then who's actually, who's playing the game? Are you playing the game or are they playing the game? It, I think it's, it's, it's a bit both. Of course, they are first, first of the road. So we always decide our tactics based on the, on the gap there is uh, with the front group. But I, yeah, I have uh, quite a bit of experience in the job. I, mm. I try to look at my power and, and see how, how I think that they can still accelerate. And for sure, if you know guys like them are in the break, they, they're going to accelerate at one point. And my idea is always to be really fast in, in the reaction. Like, for example, I know they sometimes with 50 or 60K, it depends. Uh, suddenly we come a little bit closer and then uh, they expect us to, to that we are going to slow down because we, we go yeah. slower. And then on that moment, bam, they go. Yeah. Yeah. with full gas and then it's yeah, with the level now that if it's then for example it was one minute and a half with 40 k to go and then suddenly they take a minute and a half and it's three minutes with 30 k to go then you know nowadays the the 10 uh, the minutes per 10 kilometers it, uh, it doesn't count anymore if there, uh, if there are such uh, such engines in the break so uh, yeah, I always try to be a little bit uh, ahead of that yeah. I sometimes also have the idea maybe yeah, we catch them with uh, with quite a few k's to go. In the end, it never happens because they uh, <laughs> they accelerate and it's. Uh, yeah. I'm not gonna say there are no easy days anymore, but yeah, the, I say with mm. the level with the level now, and everybody knows how to ride a, a breakaway a little bit. So yeah. Tell me about what it is like catching the break. You know, that feeling like, yeah, we've got you. We've got you now. And you actually take them back. Is that a nice feeling for you? Like, yep, job done. You guys, you couldn't beat me today. Uh, yeah, always. Yeah, when you when you know, uh, also for yourself, probably we have it under control. That's always, that's always nice when you can uh, deliver the sprinters. But then afterwards, even when I catch the break, I try to... To still keep the team in the front, if I still have some uh, a little bit of, of energy left, so I know my uh, my job is only done when I'm uh, completely mm. exhausted. So, but it's always nice when you when you feel your job is done. Of, co- of course, you also feel uh, a little bit sorry sometimes if you if for the guys in the, who spent the whole day in the, in the break and you catch them with so little K to go. But yeah, I think it's uh, it's everybody's uh, part of the job, of course. It's it's changing now. I just had this conversation. You know, 10, 10 successful breakaways in the Giro, and I think you know the evolution. Um, you know, in my opinion, how's the break change in your opinion with new technology and the way guys are riding it? Because I see, I tend to think um, that there is m- the break controls the peloton opposed to the peloton control in the break these days. Can you remember ever there being 10 breakaway victories in the Grand Tours you won- rode? I don't remember there ever being that many. Steve Cummings. No, not really. I think I think part of this as well is route design. Like looking at this year's Tour de France route, um, there aren't that many. There's a lot of stages where you think, yeah, it could be a bridge sprint, but may- maybe not. You know, um, mm. it's their route design is uh, always putting an obstacle in the final or make, making making it a bit more unpredictable whereas before it seemed like at the Tour de France you'd have 10 flat days days bunch sprints so they're definitely I think the routes routes is changing but as you say as well there's probably a number of factors including like technology aerodynamics on the bike guys being aware of fueling all that all that stuff I think that's another benefit as well of being in the break you've got drinks on tap which at the palace sometimes getting it that in the peloton is the challenge be too much different i think ben healy for sure it's like the aerodynamics of everything has got to speed everything up and whether that that's an advantage for the brake or, or the peloton i, I couldn't really tell yeah. you you know i think it can't in, in some ways it, it rolls both you know because for the breakaway you're expending less less energy but then it's harder to go faster isn't it so Mm. Yeah, it, it's, it's the roundabouts, I guess. But for sure, the radios make it a lot easier for the, the peloton to to make a judgment on whether they can catch a break or not, I'd say. But on the flip side, is it not then the exact same advantage for a breakaway? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it goes both ways. It, I guess it, it almost comes down to how you use it, really, doesn't it? Mm. You know, And if you've got the knowledge, then you can use that knowledge. But yeah, also the other guys can as well. So. Taco Vanderhorn. I think a, a lot of the things come down to the to the tactics because the material that 
the both things, the, the guys mm. who were pulling in the peloton had the be- better material, but also the guys in the breakaway. So it's a bit of the shame, but I think it's more to do with the tactics that in the past, the break went full gas from the beginning. They get uh, eight minutes and then they were tired and then the peloton get come back quite easily because also the guys in the, in the break maybe didn't turn really efficient and then it's easy to get them back. And it was always that the, the peloton was playing with the, with the, with the first group. And now it's a lot of times the first group is playing with the, with the peloton also. So it's a bit mm-hmm. of a, a change in tactics, I think that make a difference. And, uh, the 10k one minute rule, I think it's really difficult because it's so depending so much on how the parkour is, which guys are in the breakaway, uh, how they, what's the tactic they do. Uh, so it's a lot about that, that, that you cannot say, okay, these guys, uh, some guy, if they're not the good guys in the breakaway, they can, Pelican can come back really quick or when it's, uh, headwind for example of when it's a bit uphill or that kind of stuff then pelican makes so much speed so it's really really mm. depending on a lot of factors uh how the how the bunch will uh do you have any like sort of rules of thumb that you like to stick to like i don't like to get you know more than eight minutes or you know i don't like to be alone for you know 30k to the end or i don't know do you have sort of certain things that you like you don't like to do or you like to do i don't like to stop for a piss if i'm in the break or i don't know what it is what are you, do you have any certain things that you do and don't like to do when you're in the breakaway yeah i i, I don't like the double turning so uh yeah okay really i i always if someone starts with it i always uh we'll, uh, we'll say to them that it's not really handy to do so uh only <laughs> when, maybe when the speed is really high you have a downy or something but Otherwise, it's just not efficient. So uh, I think that that's always an important thing to, uh, to 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 do. Don't do. And furthermore, just don't try too fast in the beginning. I think that's also most of the time. That's depending also a bit of the race, but most of the time it's a waste of energy because the peloton decides how much they will give you. And uh, it's not yeah. about if you go faster that you get a bigger gap. It's so uh, I think that are important rules. And then you have to look. Okay when we start accelerating in the final uh, and how do you do that? And, um, and I, I think I also, I think it's important to, to, to accept that you also can just can lose and you are okay with that. You just, you, yeah. you have a plan and you, you go for that and maybe it works out. Maybe it doesn't work, but if you're too eager to stay in front then you're going to accelerate too early or uh, you, keep the high speed and then you for sure you'll not make it, but it's just because you're f- afraid to get caught back with, uh, with, uh, too, too early. But uh, I think you always have to gamble a bit to, to make it to finish. This is El Tractor, Tim Declerc. I think it's, it's, a, a bit of everything. What you say that, uh, we are, yeah, because the, the speed is, is faster with, with the faster bikes, everything. So then it's always harder to, to close the gap. Uh, if the speed is so much, you, if you, yeah, if they already go for 55k an hour, then you need to go 60 and you don't yeah. close as much. If you go uh, 60 compared to 55, then if they would go 40 and you go 45, then you, then you close the gap much, much faster. Of course, that's, uh, that's one thing, but also I'm, I, I'm in uh, the years I'm pro now, I'm not going to say uh, really that the, the best guy of the, of the bunch is, has improved so much. But I'm I'm sure that mm. uh, that that the worst guy of the bunch, the overall level is so much higher in the in the last ten yeah. years. Uh, also, they come from all over the world now. Everybody knows how to train uh, with the power meter. Every team has a nutritionist, has a trainer, everything. So for sure, yeah, the the, the overall level of the bunch is is really 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 high, and that's uh, that's what makes it uh, yeah much harder because. For, uh, normally in the flat stages is not going to be the best guys of the bunch. Uh, Pogacar uh, is not going to mm. go <laughs> in a breakaway yeah. there. Uh, but if, if the, if the uh, lesser guy is not, uh, if they improved so much, yeah, for, for example, in the tour, that every rider there is, is so strong. If you know six, seven or eight of them uh, go up the road and you're, yeah, like for, even if it's only four and you're only, you are only with two to control 
yeah, then it's still uh, the double. So you know, that's that's it's gonna be a, a big day also. What's the best break you've been in? No, I think Bing Bank was it uh, because in the Giro yeah. we didn't have the 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 best breakaway, and I think I was just that day I was strong myself, but. I was also not believe about the tactic plan and stuff. And I think Bing Bang, Bang was, yeah, almost perfect plan and good guys. And so I think it was uh, the nicest break to be uh, to be in there. And also this year I was in Cuny in the break with uh, with uh, with Derbys again, and um, yeah, some other guys were 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 really strong. So you always just need a few big guys uh, because you also can sit out of the wind behind them. That's also much better than uh, some uh, small guys. So I think that's important. And guys who understand the game and how you play it and uh, just are eager to, to also to go for it and don't uh, gamble too much and say, ah, no, I'm tired. I don't, I don't push. If everybody does one minute, I do 30 seconds. Because if you have one guy like that in the, in the group, then uh, you will not make it. I think I think being an on, the on loop break is pretty cool, you know, because I feel like start of the season, like everyone's kind of like for me, it was my first year pro. I'm kind of assessing like how good I am. Can I actually do this? You know, what what's going on here? And like, yeah, I managed to make it into the break and then actually prove that to myself that I had pretty good le- legs, you know, because I made it all the way to yeah some of the last climbs and yeah, I almost made it in the front group so. Yeah, I was, I was pretty happy with that, and I kind of feel as though yeah, a lot of a lot of eyes are on that race as well. So I think for sure, that was pretty cool. I smashed my shoulder up in Pays Basque in 2017, and I smashed the sternum, the collarbone, and the scapula. And you all know yourself; you had some injuries and all that. It's not very nice. And Pays Basque is at April, so it's it's not that far from the tour. And then eventually, I needed two surgeries, and the, the one in the scapula was quite a nasty surgery. And I didn't have that surgery until May. And in May, the team said, oh, there's no chance for the tour. In my mind, I was like, Mm. no, there is. There is a chance for the tour. (laughs) Um, And then I was kind of, I got off the turbo trainer. I'd been on the turbo trainer. Uh, I I was too heavy. And I got off the turbo trainer 10 days before. So I rode on the road 10 sessions before I went to the UK Nationals. And I'll be honest, I was like, this shoulder was weak. And um, yeah. Although I could ride the bike and I was fit because I'd been training on the bike, like from a rehab point of view, I was weak and uh, I felt vulnerable. Um, anyway, did the nationals, won both the nationals, got selected for the tour, which the team, was part of the team didn't want, but I kind of forced it and got selected for the tour, went to the tour. And then we did the stage, what I was talking about before with Perisord and, and Port de Ballest and Thomas de Ghent was in the break, which for me, he's, the best, you know, he's the best breakaway rider just because of what he's won. Um, but he was in the break, Kung and some others. And um, on Port de Ballet, the last time I'd gone there was, I don't know, five years before, and I'd had a really bad crash in the downhill. It sort of scarred me a bit mentally. Anyway, I attacked on Port de Ballet, and after that it was downhill, we had the pair of swords, and then it went down again, and it finished on that airway. So if I'd have passed, oh, the, yeah, pair, yeah. If I'd have passed the pair of swords, I felt like I could have won the race passport de Ballet, which is a horse category climb alone which was pretty cool you know it was misty yeah. and all that stuff like <laughs> in the pyrenees there's loads of people so that in itself was a beautiful feeling especially after the crash and then um yeah eventually they caught me on the parasaur but um there weren't many left and i think that was probably my best performance i would say but didn't get the result but when you got the sky train chasing you you know it's uh, it is what it is what it is um, but yeah I'd say that was my best one well there we have it guys the breakaway theory has it given you a little bit more insight to the breakaway or just a little bit more entertainment about these guys who get in these breakaways how they do it how they process trying to get in the breakaway but also how they convert a breakaway to a win i certainly learned a lot plus enjoyed listening to these guys of course el tractor the controller we're going to get to see all these guys in the tour de france well maybe not all of them but at least a couple of them in the tour doing exactly what we just learned now the tour de france is upon us and i'm over here 
with the cycling podcast. If you heard me last year, I did the last week of the Tour de France with them and they've invited me back to do the first week with them this year. It's going to be fun. So if you like hearing my voice and you want to hear more of it, well, get across to the cycling podcast, the first week of the Tour de France, and I'm going to be reporting there with the crew about what is going on day to day at the Tour. Of course, The Tour de France, our collaboration with Swiss Cycling is really exciting. I'm really excited about it. Our t-shirt is going to be dropped very soon. Go across and check it out. That's coiscycling.com to check out what is coming, the road less traveled. And I can tell you firsthand, it's an awesome tee. So I'm excited for when that's coming. Lara Behind the Scenes has been doing some great work with this collaboration, but also with the podcast. So a massive thanks goes to her. Will Jones, who puts this episode together. But last but not least, our proud partner, Rafa, who I've really enjoyed working with this year, not only through the stuff that I get to use, the kit, but actually just working with them on the podcast, the ideas they've got to put forward, and understanding a little bit more about the company and how they're going about making everyone fall in love with cycling. Guys, next week I've got Steve Cummings on the Talking Luft episode. So until then, sit back and enjoy the Tour de France. Like I said, get over and listen to the Cycling Podcast. And if not, I'll see you next week over at Talking Loft. The music in this episode was composed by Pete Shelley. Cheers, mate.